what's up guys? <clears throat> I'm getting on here. I'm gonna get my boy Blake Bevan here in a second and we're gonna get him uh, launching on. So as soon as I see him pop up, we're gonna get that going. Chris, first guy popping on brother, I appreciate it man. I'm gonna get, uh, get my boy Blake, there he is. We're gonna bring him on camera. It's adding. It's just sitting here adding right now. I don't know what the addition is all about, but it's adding all kinds of algorithms and and whatnots and things of that nature. It's going to be good. Come on, Darlene Nass, Chris Ravalico. Oh, there he is. Blake, can you hear me? Blink, blink once if you if you want to live. Blink twice if you can hear me. <laughs> What's up, brother? What's up? <laughs> How you doing? Good, good. Just trying to figure out this uh, volume on the Facebook. Are we okay? Oh yeah. No, I'm good now. Excellent. Cool, man. Dude, I appreciate it. You got it. You're all dudded up in the Dallas Tigers and all your gear right now. Yeah. Got some uh, small group practices today trying to follow the guidelines. Trying to get back to it. Yeah. Trying to <laughs> trying to get these knuckleheads back in shape. Oh, man. That's awesome. Well, shoot, man. I, I appreciate you jumping on. That's for all you guys jumping on right now. Josh, what's up? Chris, I see you. Uh, Thanks for coming on right now. Man, I, I did one the other day with Willie Pyle, and, and this has been pretty cool. So I'm sitting there coming on, uh, and I want to hear a little bit from my, my buddies. And so, uh, but give, to give you guys a little bit of introduction to Blake, um, similar as me, everybody knows us from our background in athletics and, and uh, in sports, but uh, this guy, he, man, he was a first round draft pick out of Irving, Texas, Irving High School, Irving Compton area into uh <laughs> to, to the rangers i mean out of high school we can't do that in the nfl we might die and uh and then uh <clears throat> played with played with them and then i think had his, had his major league debut with the mariners which is actually uh around the time or that that we met and so uh and so we'll get into that a little bit but we had um originally met his wife Allison at CrossFit 817 gym we were going to got introduced as a resident professional athletes and we both give each other like the who are you look you know look each other up and down like you ain't nothing and so uh but she introduced me to Blake and so uh, you know our wives become close friends and and Blake and I Blake's become one of my closest friends so uh, through a lot of crazy stuff up and down for sure but it's been pretty sweet so I appreciate you coming on man Oh yeah, anytime, man. It uh, is good. We'll, we're gonna do this. We're gonna go. <clears throat> what I want to do is 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 recap a little bit of your history. I want to go through some some times. What I like to highlight is, is the transition from playing to not, because that's a really tough time for a lot of people, especially as we're going through this pandemic where we have a, a massive unemployment rate right now. Um, <clears throat> so I think it speaks to a lot of people. There's my brother Clay. See that? Um, Clay. But if you guys got. If you guys, <laughs> if you guys got questions, um, put them in the comments. Ask them. Where, I'm going to ask some, but if you got some that pops up, you better be good. Don't make them crazy, crazy ones. But uh, ask me a good question. I'll put it on here. I will answer them later too as they pop up. But, uh, but man, dude, give give us a snapshot coming uh, at like out of high school or coming even through high school into uh, getting getting recruited, developed, and ultimately drafted and into the into uh, the majors. Like what give us give us a quick snapshot of that story and how that all took place. Well, I mean, obviously getting drafted at 18 is, you know, pretty crazy in itself just to know that you're about to step into a field of guys that, you know, are grown men, guys you've been watching on TV, guys you've kind of you know, dreamed of being on that same platform as them. Um, and I know for me at that time, being 18, you really don't think about that a whole lot. You're just kind of starstruck almost, um, imagining that this is where you could be. 
And then when it kind of comes to fruition, that's when it kind of settles in and, you know, you kind of start to gauge where you're at and what your opportunity is. Because for me, you know, I was pretty blessed, obviously, to get drafted out of high school. I mean, that's that's rare in itself. But to have the option to choose whether I wanted to go to school or start my professional career uh, at 18 was obviously a, a big opportunity for me to, to figure out which path I wanted to do. Um, and I know, you know, everybody's different. Uh, but my path, my calling, what I felt like kind of was laid on me from a, a youngster was, you know, I, I want to start playing professionally. Um, I didn't want to go to school. I didn't have any thought of going to school, uh, whether it was a dollar you know, or, or seven figures. It didn't matter to me. Um, I just felt like I wanted to start my career. And when I did get drafted and have the opportunity, you know, I, I took that path and uh, I don't think I'd do it any, any way different um, as far as, you know, do I have any regrets and not going to school? I kind of, you know, I didn't go to school, so it's hard to, to know if I would have any regrets. So I don't feel like I would. Um, but I know that you know, it's it's kind of like being in a tornado. You have a hundred million things going around you, just spinning around when you're getting drafted, trying to figure out money, trying to figure out where am I going to start, trying to figure out when is this journey going to begin, um, and then being thrown into the mix. You know, a couple months after being drafted, with all these guys coming out of college, and some of these guys that are on the verge of being in the big leagues, that was you know a big eye opener for me and. Really, I think that was probably the most humbling time in my life was getting thrown into this pool of big fish that have proven way more than I have um, already on a professional scale and trying to find where I fit in. Um, and so given the fact that, you know, even though I was a big guy, I was only 18 years old, you know, getting thrown into this mix and trying to find my place. And so that was that was probably the the best and the worst feeling at the same time um, as far as starting my career in that, in that aspect. Man, I hear that. That was, um, it's funny. You go from 18 out of high school to doing this. And by the way, Jesse said he was uh, your second baseman in high school. It was fun. Uh, playing, so. <laughs> what's, up? what's up chambers? <laughs> um, man, I sit here and think about that because uh all right, you went drafted out of high school at 18. I went undrafted at 22. So I had some maturity, but obviously was not the player in my craft. <laughs> but uh, but I, I remember this, uh, this, this massive transition of all of a sudden, like basically boy playing with these men. You know, you're talking about this young kid coming into – guys that are uh, in, in uh, mid to late 20s, even, even mid 30s, some guys, right? So you're like, right. these are developed individuals. And so, yeah, these, are, these are specimens. Yeah. And so it's, it's like I, a lot of people don't quite get the jump, even from collegiate to, um, to professional, but especially from high school uh, to professional to be able to make something like that. That's, that's pretty uh, – obviously, you have to have some good makeup, but you have to have an incredible uh, characteristic set behind that to even, even bring that to the next level. So it's, it's pretty cool. But I, I remember that being a huge shock and I needed this, I needed a year to actually sit on practice squad and to develop. So uh, that's pretty cool. But um, what, uh, so <clears throat> Jeff Neptune studs, I appreciate it, man. I know. But uh, <laughs> what I say, okay. So going to the league, um, man, I would say, because I'm from Seattle area, so I love that the Mariners is part of that, even though I don't know anything about baseball. The only thing I knew about baseball we talk about is Buner, the Bone, all right, we, uh, Edgar. Ed, Edgar Martinez, Griffey, Griffey Randy Johnson. Ed, that's right. Oh, yes. I Big go unit. <laughs> <laughs> the only guy in history that exploded a bird off a pitch. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. <laughs> Go hunting with that guy. But uh, all right, so take take us through that. Take us through like your, especially your debut. Because I, I man, I remember looking back my first start against Carolina Panthers on Thursday night football, and I got to go against Chris Jenkins, who's close to four hundred pounds, 
and, and look, I'm, I'm, you know, I was like 305, 310 playing ball, and I got to, I got to play against this. So it was a lot of nerves. But uh, how did, I mean, walk people through that. How'd that happen? What happened? Or like, how'd you feel going into that? And then, and then post feels whatever. How did you, how did you manage the, the emotions and stress going through it? Like a, 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 a time where you're like, I got to perform, you know? Yeah, to be honest with you, I'll kind of walk you through, you know, how the the lead up to the debut even happened. So uh, we had a pitcher uh, in the big leagues. Um, well, I guess let me retract. So in 2011, I go to spring training. I'm in big league camp. Um, I have no shot whatsoever to make the roster. We've got five guys um, that are all contract guys making over two, three million dollars each. Um, so I knew that going into it, but it still didn't, uh, it still didn't phase me as far as wanting to compete and try to win a spot in the rotation. Cause that's just, I, I think any athlete has that competitive mindset of, I, I don't care the, who the guy next to me is. I don't care what his, what his resume is, how many years he's got in the league. Um, it's not going to stop me from still trying to work, compete, and at least, try to push the envelope a little bit to let them consider me. Um, And I think that's always, that was always kind of my driving force to get to where I wanted to be. Um, And that's a hundred percent why I got to where I, where I ended up. But going back to spring training, I go all the way to the end of the cuts. I make the last cuts. I I had a good spring training. They liked what they saw. They told me go to AAA, you know, you're going to be the first guy. Uh, in line to have an opportunity if somebody gets hurt, um, somebody doesn't perform. And so I go to AAA. um, I'm pitching really well. I get about almost halfway through the season. And Eric Bedard um, at the time was making eight, nine, ten million dollars a year. No big uh, deal. Yeah, no big deal. And uh, (laughs) compared compared to my nine hundred dollars every two weeks, and so, um, anyways, he goes down with a knee injury, uh, but they bring somebody out of the bullpen for the next uh, week or two to replace him as the starter. And so in the big leagues, you'll have a long guy is what we call it, um, which I did a little bit of that in 13, but in 11, he got hurt. They brought a long reliever in just to eat up innings and kind of have a bullpen by committee you know, for those days that Bedard spot would come up every fifth day to start. And so, uh, you know, when you're in AAA, you kind of know what's going on. You, you're, I mean, for us, we were playing 30 minutes down the road in Tacoma. And so we, we had a bird's eye view of what was going on. And then you also, you know, you're talking to your coaches. They're kind of letting you know the game, the big league games are on the TVs and the clubhouse and AAA. So you're always watching. Um, and so, that was kind of discouraging for me at the time to know that, you know, hey, this guy goes down and they still haven't brought anybody up from AAA, even though it didn't matter if it was me. They just didn't bring anybody up. Mm-hmm. And so um, I'm sitting there going, dang, like, all right, you know, cause you're, now you're trying to figure out these mind games of, of what these guys at the top are telling you, like, oh, as soon as someone goes down, you're the guy. Well, that wasn't the case. Um, and so a few weeks later, you know, he's still not healthy, which I think they were just trying to see if he would bounce back um, instead of having to move this rookie up, you know, and starting his clock on arbitration, which is mm. then comes down to the money. And so um, anyways, he wasn't healthy. They ended up calling me up on a Saturday night after a triple A game, which we had a day game. And I'll never forget, we we get done with the day game. I go home. I get a phone call at like six o'clock from our manager and I'm like the heck's going on you know and so he says hey he said what are you doing I said nothing hanging out and he said uh (laughs) hang it out yeah yeah he said uh probably playing video games um and he said what uh what are you doing right now and I said just chilling man and he said he said why don't you uh why don't you come back up to the field I need to talk to you and so I didn't really think much about it um I got back up there he closed the door, started talking to me, and he started he started asking me if I knew the bunt defenses, the coverages, all these things that we do in spring training that you do about 2% of the season. And 
so really I was like, okay, yeah, I know how to do all those. Like I know how to field my position. I know how to cover bases. And then all of a sudden he goes, well, good. Cause you're starting tomorrow at one o'clock in Safeco. And I was, my eyes just got uh, lit up. Uh, yeah. My heart on, started, heart started pounding, pounding through my Woo. chest and, uh, trying to keep it, keep it together. And, uh, he congratulated me, gave me a big old hug, and uh, kind of sent me on my way. I started packing all my stuff. Uh, but the, the funny part about this whole thing was, you know, most guys have time to prepare for that for that opening debut, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, he literally gave me 12 hours to let my family know, my wife, everybody know what was going on and for me personally to try to prepare mentally to get ready to have my first big league start and so (laughs) right and so anyways so I get called up um I told called my wife told her hey you got to get on a plane you got to get here um and so she was able to make it and then my parents I think made it right before the game um and anyways I go on to start I had a great start, um, went seven innings, gave up one run, and we got the win. I got my first big league win, my first start, um, and then we fly right out after the game to Oakland. So I barely had time to say hi to my wife, which I hadn't seen in months, um, and then say hi to my parents, and boom, we're on a plane going to Oakland. So, I mean, it all happened so fast, I didn't have a chance to really let it sink in, which honestly, looking back, is probably a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, because I kind of just stayed in my groove, what I had been doing in AAA, and just continue to do it in the big leagues. It's just obviously a, a different pay grade and a, a different stadium and guys you watch on TV. So that's awesome. <laughs> that's um, I, I, man, I remember, I remember my my first time. It wasn't that I didn't have. I almost like I almost like the kind of throw it on you approach. Like yeah. you don't have time to get nervous. Right. right? Uh, I mean, well, 12 hours is enough time to get nervous, but it's like basically yeah. like, hey, meet me out by the trash can. We're going to fight. I mean, that was the old middle school <laughs> thing, right? Yeah. And uh, it's, <laughs> but, uh, but it was, I, I remember it, for me, when I started, my first start was at Carolina. And so, and I knew that Andre Girard, our starting from Pro Bowl Center, had gone down um, with, a, I think, a knee injury at the time. And so I was given the week to prepare. prepare and get at and at least get out a bunch of jitters at practice and stuff and so um that's it's it, there's definitely benefits to both sides but um it's that's pretty awesome to sit there yeah. and get that cause but especially while to get called up late at the clubhouse right uh and to do that it's it's funny and i it, it's it's interesting to me it's like how many of these these coaches these upper these upper management uh, like in the clubhouses or, or in the in the facilities they're still working at like midnight. And, yeah. and I had that when I was with the dolphins, um, I actually got cut at the end of the, the last round of cuts. So I had a kind of had a rough camp and then we sat for a minute. And what was funny is actually a lot of people don't know is I had a workout set up with Seattle, the Seahawks um, for the next Tuesday after the opening season. Only a couple of people know about that. And so, um, well, I'm one so of them. there you there you go, everybody. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but, uh, but I had it set up. And then that's Wednesday night at like 11 p.m. I get a call from the GM um, asking me if I'd be willing to come back mm-hmm. at, at, uh, from Miami. And, uh, uh, and so <clears throat> Jeff Ireland, who was our GM at the time, he was here with the Cowboys too. But uh, gave me a call at 11 p.m. And it was funny because you're in, it's, it's kind of like a weird spot. You're crazy late at night. They're asking you questions and all this. And I'm like, what's the point of all this, man? What do you get to get to the point? And, yeah. uh, and then finally they, they lay it on you. You know, they wanted me to bring me back. And I'm like, all right, cool. Well, let's, well, let's get to work. But, um, but that's, that's pretty, that's pretty sweet. Six story. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, for everybody, for everybody kind of listening on this and even guys that are, you know, playing professionally that haven't gotten there yet, man. Anytime you get a phone call from your pitching coach or the GM, uh, I've always kind of learned, you know, I guess I've learned that it's, it's either good or bad. There's no in between. Um, 
you know, it's either going to be the news you want to hear or it's going to be the news you don't want to hear. It's, it's not a, it's not a, a, a walk the line in between answer where it's like, Hey, if you just do this, you know, you're going to be there. You know, it's either, Hey, you're coming or Hey, you're going, you know? And so I kind of, I kind of learned that, you know, just playing throughout the minor leagues and the, and, and the big leagues going up and down, but you know, you, you don't realize how much professional sports is a business, man. Um, you know, because when you're a kid, it's just fun. You know, you're playing and you're with your buddies or you're making new friends on the team. And, you know, that's kind of what you miss the most is the guys, you know, right. because uh, and, and the coaches, you know, obviously. But, you know, as far as the front office goes and they have a job to do, you know, and, and not discrediting them on what they have to do and the decisions they have to make. But, you know, for a player, uh, it's a mental game, man. Um, and that's why I think the more you can stay off of, you know, trade rumors and all these news websites you can go to to see what people are blogging about and who's who's going to get traded, who's going to do this. Man, as a player, you learn to stay off of that because your mind just goes a million places and then you just get upset when that doesn't happen. Um, you know, when you're supposed to be the guy and somebody else gets chosen. So um, just a little insight on that. It, uh, it's funny because a lot of people, so many people, they, they understand that those emotions just looks different. Like you getting, you know, you getting passed down for a job opportunity at whatever company and like I, it should be mine and somebody else gets it and everybody knows yeah. those kind of emotions. But uh, I think what gets missed with a lot of guys is you don't understand the platform that it's elevated to. Right? I, I mean, shoot, I remember when I was starting uh, most of the season at, left guard uh, 2008 uh, for the Cowboys. And we had a real up and down year, including myself, man. I had one guy post on YouTube, Corey Proctor must die. Mm. And, and, and you're just like, really? And I'm like, listen, you know, you can't, but those, that, that weighs on people. And so it's important for a lot of people to know, like, listen, you're, you're living an exposed life that yeah. is out there for everybody to see. And yep. it, it doesn't just weigh on the player. It weighs on the entire family. Right. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, this, but yeah. Yeah. It's it's more. You know, I, I feel like the guys that that make it, the guys that you know can stay there and last a long a long part of their career. Man, you got to be so mentally tough. Um, you know, obviously injuries. You know, got us. You know, out of the game. But you know, guys that are healthy and stay in the game and continue to play and provide for their families. Man, those are some of the toughest guys mentally that you'll ever meet. Um, in my opinion, um, because, you know, you, you take the real world aspect because the athlete world, we, you feel like you don't live in the real world because you're just in your own bubble. Um, and when you get out into the real world now, interacting with people, working with people, you know, you doing your business now, I'm sure you've seen a big difference. But, man, can you imagine being judged every single time you pick up a pen Every time you talk to somebody, every time you make a transaction, I mean, anything and everything you think about, you're being judged. And now, you know, now that we're out of that space and we're, we're what I call the real world is we're out here working a job and, and, you know, doing something obviously that we both love to do, but it's still uh, different than just having a schedule, going to the field, playing and uh, coming back to your family. It's, it's a, it's a big difference. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. It's really big. It's, what's we got about five minutes. I want to keep it, uh, okay. keep it about thirty minutes for everybody. But what's Juan? I see you, man. People are asking some questions, so I appreciate it. Todd is talking about that same thing, talking about the pressure and the rumor mills. But uh, I'm coming coming to the transition now. We were a part of each other's lives at this point, which is pretty powerful. Uh, if a lot of you guys don't know, uh, Blake and Allison, his wife, were the ones that invited us to church over at Milestone Church in Keller that we go to now and was a huge piece in, uh, in, in us coming to faith and, and, and having a giant rock in our lives, good rock foundation to stand on. So that's a huge reason why we're, we're so close. Plus, we can act like a couple big dummies a lot of the times, especially when we're just hanging out. But uh, you're seeing tame versions. But uh, uh, <laughs> But take, walk us real quick, walk us through this transition, what you're doing right now, 
how that did because man, I, from the guy that I was seeing trying to make it back from injury to where you're at right now and where you guys stand and like what you're building and everything is badass. And so I tell, tell us, tell us a little bit about that transition. The, I know there's a struggle there. Um, and then, and then where you're at right now, what's you're doing some amazing things. So like tell everybody that. Yeah. So 17, uh, I was with the Mets. I ended up retiring um, I knew my shoulder wasn't where it needed to be. And, uh, I just kind of felt, I felt like I was hearing a different calling, um, of transitioning out of pro bowl and spending more time at, at home with my wife, um, actually being around a lot more, um, as well as, uh, kind of starting plan B. Um, and so, uh, as you guys can see Dallas Tigers right there. OK, um, that's the uh, that's the select baseball organization that I'm running now. I've been running for, I guess, since 2017 when I came home um, and kind of backtrack. So I started working on uh, finding coaches, uh, finding guys I wanted to help build this organization um, and kind of set a platform for youth and kids of all ages from eight years old all the way to seniors in high school to try to give them the opportunity to play for a brand and a team uh, that is focused on development as well as resumes that go on and on from guys like myself to Clayton Kershaw, Corey Kluber, Evan Gaddis, um, just to name a few um, that have played for the Dallas Tigers um, and gone on to college or gone on to get drafted and done great things. So um, for me, you know, I wanted to be part of a brand instead of kind of starting my own club. Um, I wanted to kind of give back uh, to the youth, everything that I've learned, everything that I was taught. I tried to be a sponge when I was in pro ball, just to, just to know that I could be able to uh, teach that again uh, to whoever it might be, uh, whether it was a young, young person or an older person, you know, in pro ball. And so uh, Tommy Hernandez runs the Dallas Tigers, uh, has owned it for over 25 years. Most successful organization, in my opinion, in the nation. Um, we've got over 100 clubs throughout the Metroplex, or sorry, 100 teams. Um, so we're growing and building like crazy. Um, but, man, we, we our goal and mission um, is to develop these kids and just give them the opportunity to get, a, to get exposure with college coaches. Uh, we don't try to sit there and say this kid's going to be the next Derek Jeter. We don't try to compare them, you know, to somebody that's in the big leagues. Uh, I think we get enough of that on social media and ESPN, uh, which drives me crazy um, <laughs> because, you know, because for me, we're all different, man. Um, you know, I don't like to compare anybody. We got one fingerprint, so we're, we're all different. Um, and so I just want – I always tell my guys, you do you and be the best version of you. And we're going to try and get you, get you exposure, get you seen. And these parents are spending a lot of money with us, you know, and trusting us to handle their son the right way and developing uh, and also mentoring to them as a father figure and someone else they can lean on, you know, as they go on through life. Because, you know, what we hope and pray that is these kids, whether they go to college or not, and they start their, their transition to, you know, being an adult, is that we're always going to have a, a friendship and connection to where they can always pick up the phone, text me, call me anytime they want. And I can, I can be that source to, to help them through uh, facilitating what path they're going through. Um, and so, you know, we try to provide that service to them um, and give them uh, what I was blessed to have growing up with the Tigers from 11 to 18 and, um, and just try to to help them along the way. So in a nutshell, that's kind of what we do. Um, and then I do a lot of private training one-on-one -on -one, um, with a lot of the kids I train, uh, which I love that. That's my, that's my passion um, is just having that one-on-one -on -one connection and the parents entrusting me to uh, mentor to their son and uh, try to teach them the, the game of baseball. It's awesome, man. This is, that's killer. I sit in here. It's funny you talk about college because we're just going over 
uh, college savings plans for people right now. <laughs> yeah. So um, sitting there and all we see you talk about is like, listen, ex- exercise your resources, right? This is like FAFSA forms, Pell Grants, every, any sort of aid you can go after because there's a whole lot of stuff that people leave on the table and don't, and don't just count on, you know, an athletic scholarship, even though somebody might be completely gifted. Um, right. But uh, I mean, how many stories do you have of, of guys walking on and turn out to be so I mean I got a guy who who uh, was a, a gray shirt at Idaho, uh, Jake Scott looks like the Unabomber, giant beard, but uh, <laughs> he has, he, has, he he was undrafted or, or excuse me he was um, uh, didn't have a growth spurt till like his senior high school year so he had nothing no offers really but gray shirt at Idaho ended up starting all four years for them at tackle fourth round draft pick to the Indianapolis Colts won a Super Bowl playing guard with uh, with uh, Peyton Manning and then signed like a $35 million contract with the Tennessee Titans. And so mm. it was, it, it's like, um, but he was a guy super smart and exercised all his resources, but ended up uh, athletics just compounded what he had done and uh, everything he had done to prepare for it, for that in a big way. So it's, I don't know. It just kind of came to mind when you're sharing that, but it's, it's cool, man. We'll do this. It's 1032 right now. I want to kind of uh, wrap it up um, and, and, and let you get on with your day. But, uh, man, dude, I, I appreciate you coming on. You got, for you guys listening right now, dude, we, had, we had 50. We're turning 25 right now. We had like 50-plus people on here at one time watching. This is pretty awesome. Nice. My, awesome. I see my eyes da- da- darting back and forth between the number and you. But, um, man, everybody listening to this right now or watching, if you – Blake is a huge resource. And, uh, you know, the other day we had Willie on, and he's got his gym here in South Lake, similar to Blake. This guy is concentrated in baseball, right? This guy has, has a pedigree, has a work, has experience at the biggest level. And if you're in the area and you're like, I want to I tap into that resource somehow, which I would highly recommend you do if you get a shot – Take it, right? Dallas Tigers West, he does his lessons. This guy is is on point. And uh, you better come prepared because he don't mess around too much. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, we, we don't play no games. Come to work. Um, yeah, if you're if you're interested, you know, whether you got questions or uh, your son, your family's looking for a uh, different opportunity, PM me, Facebook message me. Uh, and then we can kind of go from there. But Corey, I appreciate you having me on. You know, I love you and uh, and love uh, Megan and Grace and Hank. And I uh, got to give a shout out to Hank, new baby hey. boy. Yeah. <laughs> so um, can't wait for all this quarantine stuff to get over, so we can get back to hanging out and finding ways to uh, to get out and about. We'll give you a hug. Wait. We'll get the hug, yeah. man. <laughs> All right, brother. Hey, I love you, man. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Jump it on. I'm going to post it on YouTube. So if you didn't catch it, go check that out. Share the video. Blake, share the video with your people. I love that. Um, but if you guys got anything else, leave it in the comments, and we'll talk to you later. All right, brother. Love you, brother. We'll see ya. Love later. you. Bye. Bye.